So our speaker, Rebecca Poole, she is the historical research specialist at the National World War II Museum's Jenny Craig Institute for the Study of War and Democracy. She graduated with her master's degree in public history from University of New Orleans in spring of 2020. Her research is focused on local 20th century New Orleans history, vice and gender and sexuality. She, in her current role, she manages the Institute's Historical Research Services, which is uh, a really cool thing that the museum is now offering. Uh, so what they do is they provide assistance to special research requests from the public and conducts historical research on World War II related topics. So hey guys, um, my name is Rebecca again. I'm the historical research specialist at the National World War II Museum, where I have the opportunity to research World War II veterans and manage our research service for the public. So today I'm gonna to talk to you guys about, you know, our research service, how it works, the ins and outs, and also how do you can do this research yourself at home? So first, before we get started, um, you know, a lot of people don't know much about their World War II veteran story, or they wish they would have asked more about their service when they were still alive, or they simply just didn't even talk about it because it was painful to bring up. And so this research service generated a lot of interest and in people wanting to know more about what their veteran did in World War II, but no one really knows where to go for the information or the answers. And so that's where we came in, our research service, to kind of help people and to get started and whatnot. So we created this research service just because we had a large interest from the public of wanting to know more about their loved ones. We were getting a lot of requests from people asking, oh, hey, do you have my father's papers? Do you have pictures of my dad? The whole nine yards. And since we got a lot of requests, we decided to create this research service. Now, before I get into the topic of how our research service works, I would like to mention that the museum actually does not house military files or military records on every World War II veteran. This is a common misconception because we are the National World War II Museum. People think that we already have every veteran who ever served in World War II their record in our archives. And that sadly is not the truth. So the records in the archives at the museum houses is mainly consists of material culture that was donated by our generous supporters throughout the years. So if no one gave us the information about your veteran, we probably do not have anything on your veteran. And I like to let everyone know that ahead of time because we do get a lot of people reaching out to us like, hey, do you have a photo of my veteran? Or can you pull his file in your records? And I'm like, I wish I had that, but unfortunately I do not. So you're probably wondering, so if you can't, you don't have the records at your museum, where do you guys go for research? And that's a very valid question. So with our research service is we research the veteran's military file and veterans official military personnel files are actually all housed and located at the National Archives in St. Louis, Missouri. Um, so if your veteran served in the Army, the Air Force, Navy, Marine Corps, Coast Guard, and the Merchant Marines, all of their records are housed at the National Archives in St. Louis. So they are not located at the museum at all, but they are housed in St. Louis. And we actually have a contractor over in St. Louis. And what she does is she goes to the National Archives a couple of times a week and she pulls the files for us. She scans them and then she mails them to me. And then we review them to see if we can potentially write a narrative of sorts on the veterans military service in the form of a book. Now, before we, I talk about the military file, I will say that the book and the narrative on the veteran all depends on what's inside the military file. Not every military file is going to be the same. They're all different and they all contain different information. So we might not be able to write a book or a narrative on every veteran's file that we pull. 
So we can't promise anyone a book right away without reviewing the file. So you might be wondering, what is a military personnel file or an OMPF? Like, what does it contain? And this is basically all of the information that would be in a veteran's military service career. It would contain medical records, unit, vessel movements, rosters, medal citations, if he got court-martialed, that sort of thing, if he was punished, the whole nine yards, that type of stuff will be in the military file. They can have the good, the bad, and the ugly also in these military files. You just never know what you're going to really find. There's been issues in the past where, you know, everyone thought their grandfather, you know, was the, the boy next door, and then he found out, you know, he cursed the officer or whatnot. So you definitely need to prepare yourself that you might find out information that you're not used to seeing or knowing about your loved one. And also sometimes what veterans do or, you know, your grandfather might have done is, you know, he told you he served in Patton's Third Army and we might pull the file back and he did not serve in Patton's Third Army. So we just like to let everyone know ahead of time that, you know, you might not find the information that you were hoping for in the military files. And I will also like to go over just a few of the records that I have on display on the screen. So the first one, the pink one, is a report of fitness officers. This would be um, if they were an officer and just talking about their physical condition and stuff like that. And the one below it that says company morning reports, morning reports are super useful. They can tell you the time, the location, and what's going on with the veterans unit. For instance, sometimes they'll have a roster of uh, people who were stationed at a particular location or where they're moving to, or they could, um, for instance, like list people who were wounded or killed in action. And then in some situations I have seen in the past, some of the morning reports, who, depending on the typist, they can be very descriptive, which is super interesting because it can paint like a great imagery of the story. One situation I had was like a veteran, he was in the Battle of the Bulge, and the morning report was talking about how there it was heavy rain and the foxhole was flooded and he actually had to take like his helmet and, you know, take out the water out of the foxhole. So they can be great, you know, little stories in the morning reports that, you know, people can miss when you're looking at a military file. Um, and then below the morning report, you'll also see um, a registration card. And these are just nice. They're not necessarily always in a military file, but you can find them through like Ancestry.com or Fold3.com. And they're just really nice because they, they also include like the signature of the veteran, his previous occupation, a description of his height and weight. And underneath his height and weight, sometimes they'll include like, oh, he had a scar underneath, you know, his right chin. And, you know, it just brings back such personal memories for family members and stuff like that. Or he had a tattoo of a heart on his chest, you know, things like that that just make the story much more colorful. Now, I will say, doing the research process, you can run into a couple of dilemmas, um, unfortunately. The big one that everyone that in my department deals with is probably the National Archives fire that happened in 1973. Um, so sadly in 1973, the National Archives in St. Louis, it caught on fire. It burned for 22 hours and it burned about 75 to 80% of all Army and Air Force records. So if they, your veteran was in one of these branches, it's a strong chance that their record was impacted by the fire. But I will say, it's not that we give up cold turkey once we find out that the record was damaged. If we do find out that the record was damaged, I will then do an additional search through other databases and systems to find other records and sources to include. And then sometimes, you know, we can find great like newspaper articles on these veterans. 
that we can give to the clients. For instance, one time I had an army nurse that I was doing research on and in the newspapers of her hometown, they were actually publishing her letters that she was sending to her family. So we were able to find out, you know, what she was doing overseas and we were able to tell the family. The family didn't have those letters anymore. So it was very special, you know, for them to just see the newspaper clippings and even the burn file that we did find. And I will say just because the fire damaged majority of the records doesn't mean, you know, there, there's still not a chance that there's a file. So the National Archives have made efforts to reconstruct some of these files. Sadly, most of them are still damaged, but there's they can go through preservation to restore them in some form or way. I'm not really sure of how that process works, but we have been able to get some files back that were, you know, we could read and that we were able to translate into a narrative. And they just had a couple of burn marks on them, but we can still get the necessary information from the file to translate it to a narrative for the client. And if the file is damaged again, we have other ways of getting information. Like I said, newspapers is a great tool. We also find like unit histories online that are super helpful. And we're not going to just give up on a veteran service just because of the fire. And I'd like to let everyone know of that because, sadly, majority of the people who served in World War II did serve in the Army and Air Force. But it's there's still a chance that their file was not impacted. And I will say, sadly, there is no way for us to know if their record was burned until after we pulled the file. So there's no way I can like, you know, do a quick search on the National Archives website and be like, oh, John Smith III, his file was burned and I can just tell the client. I wish they had a system like that, but unfortunately at this moment in time, they do not. So some other dilemmas that we do run into, and I'll get into those. For instance, let's say your veteran served in the World War II, Korea, and Vietnam, and he made a career out of the military, but he didn't get out until like the mid to late 1960s. Unfortunately, we would not be able to pull his official military personnel file because of the Freedom of Information Act. And under this act, basically, people or veterans who served less than 62 years ago were not able to obtain their military file because it's not in the public domain. And the only people who can obtain that military file is the next of kin or the veteran. And they're very, very strict about this. You have to have like a death certificate, a birth certificate or something like that, proving that you're the next of kin. So unfortunately for those files, we're not able to tame them at the moment. I believe the cutoff is 1962. So veterans who were discharged before 1962, we can pull files for, but everyone after, sadly, we cannot. But you know, you can always wait and reach out to us when their file becomes available and we can pull it for you. And once again, either the veteran or next of kin. So for instance, if it's your grandfather, you probably wouldn't, your mother probably, your mother or father would have to probably pull the file. Or if your grandmother is still alive, she would probably have to pull the file. They're very, very strict. Unfortunately, when you're dealing with a government-based agency, there's just a few things that you can't get around. Another situation that comes up a lot is, say if the veteran was killed in action or if they died during the service, if their last names start with M through Z, we're not able to pull their military file. I'm not their military file, their individual deceased personnel file. And so the individual deceased personnel file is just for veterans who were either killed in action or who died during the service. This does not include people who, oh, they died after their service. That's completely different. It's just for people who were killed in action and who died during their service. So the archives are currently digitizing M through Z, so they're currently not available. I'm not sure where they are on this process. I know some people, they randomly reach out to me like, 
hey, is the file available yet? And I'm just like, I haven't got any word. But I do know that they're not waiting for, for instance, oh, we just finished all of the last names that start with M. So we'll release that to the public. That's not what they're doing at all. They're actually waiting for M through Z to be completed before they release them all. That's another common question that I get. But I will say just because I can't get their individual deceased personnel file, the information about their death, it does not mean that I can't get the their military personnel file. So I could get the information up to the time that they were um, killed in action, right before. So I'll have all of that information. Another common thing is if the veteran was an officer, when it's time to like fill out our information and get started on the research process, definitely indicate that because when your veteran becomes an officer, they get a separate file. It's kind of like it's different than an enlistment file. So they get a separate file that we would need to retrieve in order to see what they did as an officer. So it just kind of continues on. And so now I'm going to talk about how you guys can get started with us on doing the, you know, research with us. So you would first need to fill out our veteran request form online that contains like information about your veteran service, such as, you know, date of birth, place of birth, full name, branch of service, and stuff like that. I will say there is a many more fields such as like, oh, do you know his service number? If you don't happen to know that, that is completely fine. As long as I have his full name or her full name, the date of birth, place of birth, and branch, I should be able to find them. Another thing to let me know on the, the veteran request form is if they went by any other names. So, you know, around this time, there was a lot of people who were immigrants or they were first generation. So if you think they might have went by an Americanized name, definitely include that. Or if you think they might have falsified their date of birth, let me know that as well. If you think they wanted to be in the service, but they were too young and so they lied about their age, that's another really good thing to know. Once I receive their veteran request form, we also have a research fee, which is $150 plus tax, which is $164.18. Um, so we do charge this just because the museum is a nonprofit. And in order to keep our research service, we do have to charge a fee. My contractor in St. Louis, she charges us $100 per file, just to let you know, uh, no matter what's inside the file. Even if it's one page, she gets 100 bucks. So we do have to charge a fee, unfortunately. So once I receive the veteran request form and the research fee, I then take that information and I send it to my contractor in St. Louis and she tries to find the military file. Now, the process can take a couple of months. This is not something that happens overnight or, you know, it might just take a few weeks. It can take a couple of months, especially right now. My contractor in St. Louis has told me that they're doing some renovations at the National Archives in St. Louis. So that somehow is delaying the process. And I have been told that they're still working with their backlog from COVID. Their backlog from COVID is like 600,000 requests with just people requesting online. So they are, they can be kind of slow, but I have been able to get some files back within two months. So it just kind of depends on how, like, you know, what's, how she's going to find it, if it's going to be a challenge or not. But once I get the file, I'll then review the file. And if there's enough information, I could potentially write a book on the Veterans War II service. This would be a separate charge because I do have like a PhD historian writing the book and then I have to get it bound in a book. So it's it can be kind of pricey. I do have two different options, but I probably won't get into to the different options today just because since I can't promise everyone a book, I don't like to get everybody's hopes up. But to give you an idea, the book at the top left-hand corner, or actually right-hand corner, is a sample that we've done for one for someone. And then I'm going to also show you guys what they look like inside. So this is one of the books we've done in the past. It actually was an Army file. His name is James Robinson. He actually was a Medal of Honor recipient 
Um, and we were able to create this for his daughter. Sadly, he was killed in action in Italy. And she was only two years old when he was killed in action. So she doesn't really know much about her father's World War II story. So when she reached out to us, you know, we were super thrilled to have, you know, the chance to work with a Medal of Honor recipient. But it was so nice to be able to give her something like a token for her on her father since she, she didn't really get to know him at all. But to give you guys an idea, this is what some of the one of the books can look like. And it this book in particular typically takes about four months to complete from the time the person would pay for this package. It's a lot of work. Normally, these files are about 100 plus pages. And we start from their early life. And we'll, we'll go through their military service when they come home until they're, they're passing or if they're still alive. But they're very, very nice. It's a lot of layout, finding pictures on our side. It's kind of time consuming. So that's why it takes four months. But they're very, very nice. And this is Dolores. This is his daughter when she was younger. She was so sweet. But yeah, we were super thrilled that we were able to do this for her. The story actually made the New York Times, so we're pretty proud of that. But they're really great tokens for everyone. We don't do this these type of books a lot just because they do require a lot of information. And they also, they, they are a pretty steep fee, I will say, uh, whenever that comes to time. But let me go back to the PowerPoint. Let's see. All right. So yes. So if you are interested in getting started with our research service, you can either email um, the email address that we have on the screen, research.services at national www, the number two museum.org. And I also have this QR code that will bring you straight to our research service page. And it explains everything that I just went over and how you can get started. And now my next slide is for people who want to do individual research themselves and they don't want to go through us and they enjoy, you know, doing all the legwork. So you'll see this book on the left hand side, Finding Your Father's War. I highly recommend getting this book if you want to do the research yourself. It will help you about how to get the file, how to find more information. It goes over... Um, how to understand military maps, acronyms, which is a huge thing. So when you're looking at a military file, it's basically like looking at another language. It really is very challenging. And there's so many different acronyms. You can find some of them online, but I will say this book on the left-hand side, Finding Your Father's War, does a great job of explaining how to understand a military file finding the different acronyms and where to go for more information. And we also did create a research guide ourselves in the Institute. So this one, the on the right-hand side, this research guide is the um, guide that Elizabeth sent out to you guys. And so this can teach you how to do the process yourself. I will say it doesn't have an, all the information as finding your father's war, but I would suggest still reviewing that material as well. Now, other things that you can look into besides, you know, these two books and the National Archives is you can try to pull unit histories from the National Archives in College Park, Maryland. So the National College Park in Maryland, they have unit histories. They also have diaries. So that can help you like piece together your veteran story that way if, you know, you find out that the file was damaged. Sadly, I don't have a direct contact at the College Park National Archives branch, but I'm sure, you know, there's, there's a researcher that you can hire at that branch that can pull the unit history or the diaries for you. Another good resource would be the Eisenhower Library in Kansas. They also have a large collection of unit histories dating back from World War I to, I believe, um, 1952. Um, so those are some other tools that could be very, very helpful for you when doing your own research. 
Um, but honestly, that's about it, guys. And um, I'm sure you guys have some questions. And I'm sure I also left out a bunch of different things. So and I apologize. But that's basically the runaround of how our research service works, the different dilemmas that we come across, and how we can help you guys, you know, do the research yourself. So whenever y'all are ready, I we can start the questions. As one can expect, there's several questions slash comments about the fire. Some people asking, like, you know, if a file was destroyed, is there a way of, like, kind of reconstructing it? And somebody else had also said that they had contacted the museum years ago about information for their father, and they were told uh, probably no information, information available since his records were destroyed in the fire. Is that still true? I don't want to throw shade on the National Archives in St. Louis, but I have been told from several clients um, and people I have done books for that they have tried to reach out to the National Archives themselves and they have been told that the file doesn't exist or it was damaged by the fire. And then they come to me and I pull the file and it does exist or it was damaged and there's still some information. So sometimes, and I'm not throwing shade on the National Archives, they just receive a lot of um, inquiries. Sometimes I think, you know, they might tell people, oh, it was damaged by the fire, just to, you know, to clean up their backlog because they get a lot of requests. Yeah. And I mean, I understand that they're probably very overwhelmed and there's probably not a lot of people staffed. So there's still a chance um, we would try to pull the file and then we could try to see if we can find additional records and resources to include with the burned file. So for instance, if I get a burned file back, sometimes it might only contain a final payment stub, but sometimes there's clues on the final payment stub. They'll talk about, um, you know, it will say, oh, they were in foreign service in these two particular dates, right? And it'll give me something called an APO number, which mm -hmm. stands for Army Post Office. And so there's a roster online of all of these APO numbers. And so I can look up the APO numbers and it will give me the location. And then I can say, hey, they were in Belgium from these two times. And then I can piece it together somehow that way. So there are clues from that, you know, we can find that I, I think a lot of other people can miss just because if you're not familiar with the military knowledge or background, um, it can be missed very easily. And since we're able to look at it, we know what the acronyms are, we can find more information that way to, you know, find more records for you guys and help piece together their story. A couple people were asking about, like, when you were talking about, I had to take a screenshot of the slide so I could remember exactly what this person was asking. Uh, when you were talking about other dilemmas, the veteran served in the military until the mid to late 60s. When you say served, are you referring to uh, reserves after active duty is done? Yes. Yeah. So if they made like a military career, um, you know, out of the army or if they were in the reserves, if they were in the service until the mid 60s, like I think it's 1962, it's basically 62 years from today's date, um, we can pull their file. But if it's after 62 years, I won't be able to pull their file because it's not in the public domain. So right. if they served in like 1963 or in Vietnam, I can't touch their records because it's not in the public domain. So the next of kin would have to pull the file or the veteran. Now, um, assuming everybody's dead, right? Veterans passed away. Um, like this person is asking specifically, uh, they're saying, I'm kind of assuming that if your parents are deceased, then you can request a grandparent's record since the next of kin, your parents are deceased as well as the veteran. So yeah, if you're next, yeah, if you're next, then you can request the file. Um, I've had people where like they want to request their uncle's file and then they told me that they're not on good terms with their cousin. And I, unfortunately, I can't help with that situation, but that's not his situation at all. As long as you're next of kin, you can request the file. Does the museum not offer Navy records? 
So we can pull files on Army, Air Force, Merchant Marines, Coast Guard, Marine Corps, and the Navy. I think I, I said all of them. Um, so we can pull on all of them. Um, I just focused on the Army and Air Force because those are the ones that were heavily impacted by the fire. And yeah. most people served in those branches. So yeah. I just like to emphasize that. But if they served in the Navy or any of the other branches, they are fine. They don't have to worry. There's a file out there. Would a sergeant in the Army have a separate file? I'm not sure what they mean by that. So it, he's talking about, so since he was a sergeant, he was an officer. So once um, a, a soldier or a service member becomes an officer, you receive a separate file, um, separate from your enlistment file. Um, so there's an officer file, there's the official military personnel file, there's an IDPF, the individual deceased personnel file. There's a lot of different terms and acronyms, but yes. So the main one, but if he did, if he was a sergeant, we would also have to pull his officer file to see what he was doing um, when he was a, an officer. So regarding the book, um, is, it, is it a hard copy or can it be a PDF? I think this person's saying that it would be nice to be able to share with other family members and PDFs are easier. Once we finish it, um, it is a hard copy. So it is a bound book. I have one on my desk. So this, I know you can't see it because it's like light, but this is, this is the hard copy. They're very, very nice. Um, but once we finish it, I can definitely share the PDF with everybody. Um, it's no problem at all. We can definitely share the PDF once the book is completed. Um, and I did only show you guys one book, the one that takes a million years to complete, but I do have another one that's just less sophisticated and not as much work, um, which is still in a bound book. It's just about four pages of text and it includes the military file inside. Regarding the handout, is the QR code, I think you brought up a QR code, is that in the handout? So the QR code that was on the research guide slide will bring you to directly to the PDF research guide link. Do the World War II CBs fall under Merchant Marines? And are those records available anywhere? The World War II CBs actually fall into the Navy, um, and they are available. Um, I will say Merchant Marine records are also available. So if anyone you know served in the Merchant Marines, we can also pull their files as well. A couple people were asking about proving that you're next of kin uh do you have to prove it like if so what do you need to prove it somebody else was saying that they have a grand uncle that never married or had children so like who qualifies as next of kin like how complicated do we need to get i will say uh it is it is complicated they do require like a death certificate and birth certificate i've never had to request one myself but I've heard of the process, but I have heard it's kind of complicated and good luck. I apologize. It's not easy. And I will say when you're doing, um, they call it a FOIA request because it stands for Freedom of Information Act, blah, blah, blah. So when you're doing a FOIA request, it's going to take for some reason 10 times longer than, you know, doing a request if it was in the public domain. A couple of people are very excited about the book. Uh <laughs> And they were wondering, you know, approximately, like, how much does that cost? Is it a flat fee? Does, is there a range? And another person was like, if you choose not to get a book, will you still get all the documents that were found? So after I review the file, let's say we can do this glamorous book that I just showed you guys. Um, it is very expensive just because it's labor intense. Um, I have a PhD historian who will work on writing the narrative and that's it for like two months. And then it's a lot of work for me to do the layout and the pictures and stuff like that. So buckle up, the price is $4,000 plus tax. But, but I am willing to work with people. Um, you will, no matter what, you're still gonna get the military file that we received back from the archives. You don't have to pay for the book at all. You're paying for just the military file. Um, and if you really want this glamorous book, which I call the premiere, 
um, I can split the payment up into two and you can pay half at one time and then the other half at another date. But I do have a, another option that's much more affordable. Um, it's not as glamorous as the one I showed. It's about four pages of text that summarizes the military file and the veteran's military experience. It's still in a bound book and it also comes with the file inside of a bound book. Um, and that is 600 plus tax. Because once again, I still have to pay for someone to write the the narrative. And it's the a lot papers. of work. It's, and just, they are. just the They're... research is hard. It's not yeah. easy. As it's all of you who are attending this program No, doing this research is not yeah. the it's, easiest. It's yeah. not a walkthrough park. Um, the, the narrative, just to give everyone an idea, it's literally the, the glamorous book for $4,000. It's about 20 pages of text without layout and pictures and it's single space. So it's a lot of information. It's a lot of work to translate the file. Um, but if you can't afford that, you can also opt to do the, the, the smaller tier, which would be the $600 plus tax that I call the plus package. It's not as much work because it's a shorter narrative, um, but you're still getting a nice token to pass down to your family. Um, I haven't gotten any complaints so far about the plus package, so they're still very nice. It's just it's not as much work. Um, it doesn't include any of the pictures that I find because that also takes time. But I can include like a personal photo to make it special for the family. I love this next question. How do you obtain the photos? I have photos that my father took of a bridge in France that he was involved in rebuilding. So when it comes to finding the personal photos of the veteran, sometimes I have there's like the, it looks like a, a mugshot, but sometimes like the Navy, the Marine Corps or the Merchant Marines, they will have what it looks like a mugshot in the military file. So I can use that. And then I'll also reach out to the family members for the personal photos of the veterans. But I can also find photos like of their early childhood through yearbooks that are on ancestry.com. And the other photos that I use to make up of the, the glamorous $4,000 package, I look through other, you know, public domain sources to find these images, such as the Naval History and Heritage Command, if they served in the Navy. Um, it's just, it's very, it's a lot of work to find the pictures that are in the public domain, especially if you want them to look good. Um, I will say that, but uh, but that's how I go about finding the pictures. I have like, if you are interested in finding photos, I have a whole, I can send this to Elizabeth. I have a whole like list of websites that are images that are available in the public domain that helps me out a lot. If you are interested in finding, you know, free photos that you can use because, you know, you might find a great shot, but guess what? You have to pay $500 yeah. to, you know, what is that one that everyone use? Getty or something? So yeah, it's yeah. Getty. You're paying yes. for a licensing fee. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I I mean, it's already so much work. I'm not going to spend yeah. $500 on one image. So somebody was asking, is the book Finding Your Father's War helpful for doing Navy research? It is. It doesn't just, I mean, I will say it, it does U.S. Army, mm -hmm. but it's good to just finding like, what is it? the military file and it's also great for like a list of acronyms i can't you know describe enough how hard it is to understand a military file when you're just looking at a bunch of acronyms so i would still suggest getting finding your father's war i will say the the research guide that we offer talks more about the navy and it it's free <laughs> we just sent it to you guys um but i think finding your father's war is still very very useful I highly recommend getting it. The resource you mentioned a, mo a minute ago, the list of all the places where you can get public domain images. Uh, for those who would like a copy of that, please send us an email to genealogy at acpl.info and I'll send it to you. So I have a list of helpful sources for photos and then also just for like finding unit histories, um, vessel logs and stuff like that. I'll send that to you as well. It's not in a glamorous document. <laughs> it doesn't need to be pretty. Feet, so I will send it to you guys. But yeah, I have several resources that can help 
um, especially for the Navy, the Naval History and Heritage Command, their website is incredible. They have so many free images. They have so many like daily logs, ship logs, um, you name it, they have it. So highly recommend if you're looking for Navy information, the Naval History and Heritage Command. One question about the OMP is, um, are immigrant service personnel that could be naturalized through military service, is that, is stuff about that included in the file or no? I haven't seen that before, but that doesn't mean that yeah. it can't be in there. Um, you would be really surprised what I have seen in military files. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So it doesn't mean that it's not in there, but it could be, especially like if they were becoming a citizen and it was fast tracked, maybe during the military service, yeah. there might be information and dialogue uh, between the service members, officer and you know, yeah. different offices and stuff like that. So maybe, not 100% sure. Kind of on the same vein of like the things in the file. Somebody else has said that they got their father's army records from NARA, but they were so heavily redacted, like you don't really get much information. And they were wondering, is there another way to obtain this information or just obtain the records? I mean, if you got it and there wasn't much they gave you, the next step, if you do happen to know the unit history, um, that he, he or she, you know, was with, I would suggest contacting the National Archives in College Park, and you can get a researcher to scan the, the unit history or the unit diaries, and then you can track the veterans or the service members' service through the unit history and diaries, um, and you could piece together the story that way. Now, somebody wanted to know what is the big differences between like your service and what you can find on fold three, another person of a similar vein, like timetable, is it faster to go through you guys or requesting from NARA? And also the final piece of this puzzle, can you get this type of information from the VA if the veteran died in the sixties and was covered by the VA? The information we find is 10 times better than fold3.com. Um, we do a, a thorough search of finding more records, even if the person's um, file was damaged. So I would definitely say um, that our research service is worth it if you're comparing it to full3.com. Um, and the other one, what was the other part two? Um, so what is the timetable compared to, so requesting from you guys, is that faster than requesting from NARA? Yeah. That's a good question. Um, I will say, I believe that we are faster, um, just because they are working with a limited amount of people, um, pulling files and scanning records. And if you're requesting the record, you would need to go in person to make it go, the time go faster. So you would need to make a trip to St. Louis and try to pull the record yourself. And I think that would, you know, make the timeline be faster for you. But if you're going to try to request it through online, you're going to be waiting a long time. And I just want to prepare everyone for that. But if you do it through us, us, it will be faster than if you do it online. But the fastest results would be you guys going to St. Louis, going to the National Archives yourself, and, you know, speaking to the archivist to pull the file. That would be the fastest re result. Um, I know not everybody can do that, so that's why they opt to do um, the online, but I will say they, do, they are swamped with requests, um, and it really does help for us because we have someone on the ground in St. Louis to pull the files. Yeah, I think somebody told me recently that they waited two years for requests to be filled, and I think that's kind of the average right now from yeah. NARA. Yeah, it's it's very slam. To give everyone an idea, um, so the National Archives, they were closed until the summer of 2022. So for all of that time, they weren't doing, I don't know what they were doing, but they weren't pulling files. They weren't doing requests yeah. at all. So they had a huge backlog of things that they had to do. Yeah. And there's still people requesting files every day asking yeah. the same thing. And um, yeah, the, the backlog they have to work with is huge. So if you're not going to go in person, 
then you should probably go through us if you want to do this in a timely fashion. Does uh, the museum ever do any World War I research? As of right now, since we are the World War II Museum and our historians specialize in World War II history, we only focus on the World War II veterans. But let's say your veteran or grandfather, he served in World War I and in World War II. When we pull the military file, we will get all of the information from World War I and World War II. So if we uh, get the file back and it's all intact, we could write something for you, but we wouldn't focus on the World War I experience. We would probably just mention it in a paragraph or so, just because we're not specialized in that field. But you will still get the records from the World War I service and the World War II. Does the National World War II Museum add photos and military records, like Army records, to your collection, especially if the vet's Army record did not, well, if it did burn in NARA? Uh, speaking from experience, my family donated my grandfather's photographs to the World War II Museum probably, like, in 2010. So, yes, but Rebecca could speak more intelligently about it than I can. <laughs> We do accept records, pictures, um, and stuff like that from supporters. I guess w earlier when I was talking about, you know, uh, oh, we might not have your veteran in our collection. It's just because we get a lot of people like, oh, do you have a picture of my dad? And we wish we did, but if no one donated a picture of your dad, we don't have it. But we do accept pictures, letters, records. Uh, from people whose files were not burned or whatnot. Um, I can also send Elizabeth the, we have an email address that you can email for more information on, you know, what our museum accepts and what they do not accept. Um, I know we have a large collection of swastikas, so we don't need that anymore. And there's a lot of other things that we have that we don't need. But I will send that information to Elizabeth and she can get you in touch with them. I want to share my screen really quick and just point something out to everybody. You know, if you have things that have already been scanned um, or say you need it scanned before you donate or whatever, you can also send things to us. Uh, we actually have a collection called Our, Our Military Heritage. If it's one of our free databases, you should be able to access it from home. If you click on this red Our Resources button, and then just scroll down to Our Military Heritage. So what I'm getting at is many copies keep things safe. So send stuff to the War with Team Museum, but send stuff to us as well. Um, when we digitize it, we'll put it on our website for free. We have biographies, stuff about burials, diaries. And then we have these nice pages for individuals. So let's pick this guy. So we, if you click on an individual, if we have a bunch of different stuff for that person, we'll put it all together like this. So as I said, many copies keep things safe. So if you would like to send us stuff, we accept this stuff as well. And we can also, when we scan things, we can give you a copy back. You don't have to outright donate things to us. You can loan it to us. We can digitize it and return the original. If you'd like a digital copy, we could give that to you too. And then you could pass it on to the, to the World War II Museum. Thank you, Rebecca, for such an awesome wow. presentation. Thanks for joining us today. No, and thanks. Thank you guys so much. Um, and if you guys need anything, um, she'll also give you guys my email address if you'll have any other questions. Nice talking to you guys and good luck on the research.